All right, so moving on. ECG rhythm interpretation and analysis. We've talked about the ANP. We've gone over the um, electrical properties of the myocytes. We've talked about how to lay out the leads and how the leads measure that flow of electricity depending on what angle you're looking from. Uh, again, focusing on lead two as the primary one that we'll be using for this lecture. Now it's time to take and apply a uh, standardized structured method to analyzing these rhythms in order to figure out what the heck you're dealing with. So here we go. Now for the advanced class talking about QRS variations, um, the nomenclature, how we decide to choose capital letters versus small letters, whether to use a prime, basically works like this. So if your height, so your volts, millivolts, is greater than five millimeters, that gives you a capital letter. If it's less than five millimeter, lower case. And if it's the second one, um, it gets a prime mark, which is essentially that little apostrophe next to it. So let's walk through and do these. This would, so we'll start in this upper left. This is actually technically a QRS. This would be QR. I would say this one could be RS. This one would be QS. That one's just an R. This one could be Q R R prime S R R prime R capital S Q R S sorry Q R Q R R prime Q R S those are just really quick examples and of course these other ones are marked out better here in this box on your right um, these first two right here I'm just gonna make mention of this now um, are classic examples if you look at them from V1 because that's another important thing which lead you look through will alter what you're seeing in looking through V1 these two patterns right here um, are classic right bundle branch block patterns, which you can only find with a 12 lead EKG. Um, if you're only, if you're looking at lead two and you see something like this, um, all you can really confidently say is that there's a bundle branch block and that you can't identify which side, right or left. You need that 12 lead to really diagnose these kinds of things. But, there it is. Okay, action potentials, refractory periods. Uh, this is why we uh, cardiovert when we can instead of defibrillate. So let me explain what I mean. Um, in talking about an absolute refractory period, the zap has already occurred. And after the zap occurs, those charge, those cells are recharging and no amount of electricity applied from the outside is going to make them discharge again. Um, whether it's a car battery or a defibrillator, it just won't work, it won't help. So you have to time the zap at just the right point if you're going to do something like cardiovert. Now, so during this period, nothing really is going to happen whatsoever. During your relative refractory period, you've done just enough dragging of your feet to kind of build up that electrical charge the cells have so that if a stimulus is applied here, you could actually get an early discharge um, before it's actually completely reset itself and it's ready. And that carries with it a handful of problems and a handful of risks. So if you... Um, Consider them separately. We'll just look at the atria first. Because all the cells in the atria are 
practically identical to the ones in the ventricles, so the exact same things can happen to both. Um, in the atria, if you have an early impulse or an early stimulation, you wind up with something that's like a PAC, right? Which, if the uh, ventricles are past their refractory period, will be able to fire. Now, in the ventricles, if you have that stimulus happen, you wind up with something like a PVC, right? Assuming all of the ventricle is ready to roll. Um, and that's not necessarily, it's never normal. It's not something you should be excited to have happening. Um, but keep in mind that things like frequency um, and coupling or pairs um, is never good. And so that's something to really keep an eye on. If those start picking up, that's a sign that things could get worse. And that's whether it's a PVC or a PAC. Um, in terms of a practice update, though, something I do want to mention is the R on T phenomenon. Um, which we typically think would lead to something like torsades. Uh, new information actually shows they've studied it and that your risk for torsades is essentially the same if you're coupling or you have R on T. It, one's not worse than the other. They're both equally bad. Um, but to keep that in mind, just because they're doing R on Ts, you don't have to get as excited as you used to. You should still be worried, but just R on T is not a grave prognosis like it used to be. Some additional comments I want to make on this for the advanced arrhythmia class is uh, specifically what medications they uh, might be on. Um, so with the antiarrhythmics, if they're on any of the um, quinidines, uh, your antibiotics, the ones that are um, a really good one would be like erythromycin. Zithromycin, uh, Leviclin, things of that nature are a pretty good job of kicking them up. Uh, your SSRIs, or oops, sorry, SSRIs are pretty good for that. For your antipsychotics, good old Haldol. And this is the one that we probably see most often triggering something like this. Uh, so it's really, really imperative that you keep an eye. So um, how high is too high? Well, once they start getting up in the uh, 650, sorry, 0 0.65, 0 0.700 range, really, really, really watch out. So there is a little bit of a cushion between, you know, 0.48 and 0.65, but it can happen really quick or it can happen slowly over the course of a few days and no one notices it. So please, please, please always keep that in mind. Um, EKG changes other than this wide QT. Um, look out for, you know, if they're in a sinus bradycardia because of this, uh, they could have some kind of sinus block occur. Um, they could also have just um, partial heart blocks. maybe a type one, type two, things of that nature. And of course, any premature complexes always run that additional risk of kicking them into that VTAC, uh, specifically polymorphic. So as you might've noticed, the alarm that tends to go off most frequently is actually gonna be your QTC alarm. Um, which is very, very similar. What makes this um, important and actually a better measure of your QT interval is this. Um, so when your heart rate is going fast, because everything is sped up, that actually makes your QT shorter. And then when you have a slow heart rate, it equals a wider QT. So in the same individual, when their heart rate changes, how do you adjust for that so that you can compare someone with a tachycardic heart rate to someone with a, well, let's say bradycardic heart rate. Well, what you do is you 
correct for it. And so that's what this graph represents is how to correct for the uh, QT based on how fast their heart rate's going. So let's just take a quick example. Um, so let's say we have someone who's going at 60 beats per minute and someone that's going at 110 and see what we get. So at 60 beats a minute, if we come up here, and we'll just, pink is of course your average, and that's gonna land here, which is about right here. So that's a, sorry, QTC of about 38. Now that same person, if their heart rate is going 110, is about right here. So if we follow along, has a QTC of 280. And that's how you can compare those two things together. So if I measure one that's 380, ooh, that's a, maybe a little bit long. Well, no, in reality, it's not. That's been corrected for the speed that they have. Uh, now, if you wanna see what the upper end of normal would look like at 60 beats per minute, well, then that's what this guy's gonna be up here where your upper end is probably in the or 40s or so, and vice versa at 610, upper end of normal. Um, if we do the yellow line here, that traces across to about right here, which we'll say is probably about 320. So that's a point of QTC is so that you can compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Um, this is probably what's really important the upper end of normal is 500. And you can essentially say that anything greater than 500 millisec is not normal. And you've probably noticed that already. When it comes to QTC, we actually represent that not as a uh, 0.28 seconds, but instead we call it 280 milliseconds. Essentially the same thing, very similar measurement. It's just the way things are communicated. Um, now, you're likely to actually have some elevation in uh, the patients that come through a hospital uh, simply because they may have a history of cardiac disease or um, medications that they're on that they're taking on purpose to slow down their heart rate. And one of those side effects is uh, QTC being widened. What's most important though, is it worsens with severity of cardiac dysfunction. So if their heart is doing poorly, the QTC will get worse. So keep track of that kids. Prolonged QT interval and or QTC is associated with risk for what lethal rhythm? And so just look through the list, which of these are lethal? Well, AFib is not a lethal rhythm. Uh, third degree heart block can be lethal, but that doesn't really have to do with the prolonged QTC. Pulseless electrical activity, also not in that realm, which really just leaves us with the polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, also known as uh, torsades. And that's the truth here. Uh, the big, big lethal rhythm risk for prolonged QT interval is to wind up with a polymorphic VTAC. The monitoring system is alarming. QTC, 650 milliseconds. You look back and find out that it was 425 yesterday. Which intervention should be performed? Well, is this emergent or a non-emergent item? As of right now, you have to ask the question, you know, what's normal? And so looking back, for men and women, it's slightly different, but ultimately we don't get excited until it's greater than 500 millisec. So at this point, the patient has a uh, QTC that's greater than 500, and so we need to react accordingly and ask again, is this an emergently high item or is it just something that we need to keep a close eye on? And the truth of the matter is, as long as they're still in a normal sinus rhythm or something like that, it's not emergent. So for this, it's not a false alarm. 
and I'm not going to say that these are emergent. And so telling the CNA really won't change anything because it doesn't have to do with lead placement or anything of that nature. It really just leaves us with non-emergent, but notifying the primary nurse of the rhythm change so that they can go through and figure out what the cause of that is or work with the uh, provider. The monitor tech has notified you that the patient's QTC has increased from 425 milliseconds yesterday to 650 milliseconds today. Which combination of new medications may be responsible? And so this is a question of what medications are well known for causing a increase in the QTC for patients. And kind of the hint I gave you the other day was it's, or with the presentation is using the antis. So stuff like, uh, is it analgesics? No, not really. Is it antiarrhythmics? Yes, it is. Makes sense because some of those drugs specifically slow down the heart. Antibiotics, particularly uh, levofloxacin, also known as Leviquin, that's a really good one. Antipsychotics, uh, particularly Halperidol, that's a big one. Anti-inflammatories, no, steroids really don't mess with your heart rate all that much, so it's not anti-inflammatories of that nature. But antidepressants can, and so in combination of the antidepressants, antipsychotics, antibiotics, antiarrhythmics, those are the big ones that you really have to watch out for, and those are the four that I would say you need to look at. So continuing on, talking about um, the QRS T wave and prolonged QT intervals, I want to talk about something really cool called the U wave. And what that is, is if you just follow that same alphabet that we've been talking about before, where you've got your your Q, your R, your S, your T wave, well then every now and again you may see this here, <clears throat> where there's this little bitty lump right after the T wave, but it's too far away to qualify as a P wave. <clears throat> and basically what that is, is the U wave. Um, now in general, uh, the best places to see it, it's gonna be an upright deflected wave, same direction as the uh, T wave should be going. Um, and it's V2 through V4 is your best places to see it. It's going to be tiny, less than two um, millimeters tall. It'll have that same polarity like I mentioned. The reason why we're talking about it now is if you're not paying attention and you go to measure your QT interval, you may actually accidentally include the T and the U wave together, giving you a longer measurement than you wanted to. Um, which is then an inaccuracy. So uh, who gets them? When do they happen? Um, well, at the end of the day, uh, there's still a bit of uncertainty about what causes them to happen. Um, but there are certain scenarios and certain conditions where they appear more frequently. Uh, the first one is uh, pronounced hypokalemia, you know, your low potassiums. Um, another condition is... Uh, when you have severe bradycardia, the U waves tend to be um, more visible um, if they're occurring. Another fun one is your antiarrhythmics, which is actually pretty much the same list as what causes prolonged QT intervals. So it's one of those you have to be wary in those situations that you're not uh, mistaking one for the other. And um, of course, an intracranial hemorrhage, that's that hinted head injury again. Um, and then, of course, congenital long QT syndrome, which is uh, another type of thing that can happen, which may produce these U waves as well. Um, at the end of the day, just making you aware that they exist. So if you're in a scenario where you see a T wave, a U wave, and then something else, you don't accidentally mistake it for um, non-conductive premature beats or etc. So. Let's do a really good example, a real life example that I just came across recently. So this strip I actually just came across here within the last week. Um, now this is the 12 lead layout coming from easy mode. Um, and the reason why I have this here is, well, you've got your two lead here across the bottom. And as you can see, there's nothing too fancy about it. 
Um, it's not really easy to read, but here you can see you've got your PQRS and there's not much of a T wave. But if you look in leads V1, V2, and V3, you will see a clear P wave. You've got your QRS here. And then you've got your T wave, but then you have this. And then you've got your P wave again. And I will draw these out that that's your T wave. And then right there again, this is your U wave. And then if you look, you'll see even easier to read in your V2. It's quite present and you can really see the P wave next to it. Um, and then, of course, in your V3, there it is again, that U wave. This is a T. And so, yeah, someone might, you know, looking through this strip, accidentally think it's something else, or if this U wave was showing up in the two lead, um, could lead them down the wrong path in terms of their uh, interpretation. So that's a U wave. That's what they look like. This is a really, really classic example of how to find one. So keeping on the theme of unique things, um, escape beats is one of those. We usually talk about premature beats quite a bit because they happen pretty frequently. Um, but on the other side of the coin, there's situations where the SA node may not be firing quickly enough or interrupted, um, or um, maybe the AV node even you know, winks out too and is not able to do its job. Either way, an escape beat occurs when there's failure of impulse generation by the faster or upper pacemaking cells. Um, and usually what you'll see is they occur after a, um, it's usually variable, but they'll occur after a pause that's longer than the underlying sinus cycle. So what's a good example of that? So we'll look at this first one here, and I'm just going to mark these out. I'm not going to count them out, but I'll just have you trust me that the length of the P to P across here is 24 small boxes and that the problem here is that you'll see that we have an extended period without any heartbeat. Well, and then we have our first escape beat, and you'll notice that there's no P wave in front of it. So we're gonna measure from the start of the QRS and the start of the QRS over here. And what that winds up giving us is a run of Let's see, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. 29 uh, small squares before it kicked in. And it's technically even longer because you have these additional five here that were from the P wave. So this actually went 34 until it really kicked in. And then if we measure the next one, I'll just run a little bit lower to help delineate that. This one here winds up being 28. So we have two situations where the time without a pulse went long enough that the heart decided to just go ahead and, well, I shouldn't say the heart, the AV node kicked in instead with its intrinsic rate and took over. And you'll notice with both of these that neither has a P wave. And so for that reason, uh, because there is no P wave in front of it, but the QRS otherwise looks normal, that is a junctional escape which we'll go over junctional rhythms as time comes. I just want you to see the idea of escape beats here. Uh, something that may make a little more sense would be the one that's below that, where we again have one, two, three heartbeats, and our P to P interval from here to here comes out right at 27. Um, but then our next P to P, which is here, all the way to here is 37. And what makes this unique is if you look at how these P waves are shaped versus this one here, which is taller, it's peaked, it's got a, a weird roundness to it. Um, and even the second one over here. So let's go ahead and measure this out. And this one here has a P to P of 30. Again, longer than that initial one of 27. In this case, this is an atrial escape beat. 
and in both of these situations, the, sac- the same scenario presented itself. You had a normal heart rate moving along, where then it slowed down. Slowed down to the point where an escape beat took the place of a natural beat because one didn't show up. Um, and so that's junctional escape, atrial escape. So when you have early beats, there's a couple different scenarios that can arise in terms of how it falls um, in between the rest of the rhythm as you see it. Um, one of the more common things is having a uh, compensating pause or compensatory pause. Uh, so there's two types. There is a compensatory and a non compensatory and a non-compensatory pause. Now for a full uh, compensating pause, that's actually going to be um, greater than two times whatever the P to P interval is. I realize this one uses R to R, but P to P works a little bit better because P waves are what trigger the next beat, right? And in a non compensating pause, it's going to be less than two times the P to P. Well, what's greater than two? What's less than two? Well, it's actually the gap that's going to be doing these things. So let's look at this first example here. Um, I've measured out this first P to P, and that's going to be 16 small boxes. So then if we measure out all the way across here to the next P wave, you actually get 32.5. It is just a hair over two times 16. Which is really kind of cool. So that counts as a full compensating pause. Now had this gap been less than that, it would have been a non compensating pause. Well, what if you have this situation, what you see down in the bottom right corner, where that interval is exactly one times whatever the P to P, or in this case, R to R is. Well, let's find out. So right here, that is 16. And if I measure out right to here, that also comes out to 16. And that's exactly what that is. When a um, when a premature beat occurs between two normal sinus QRS complexes and that P to P interval um, between those um, is exactly a correct P to P interval, usually what that means is this premature beat that occurred wasn't able to. Um, interrupt the uh, refractory periods of what was already going on. Um, and in this case, because it's a PVC, you had, you run the risk of a retrograde conduction. And that retrograde conduction can sometimes throw off the uh, sinus node. And that's what you get actually up here. If you look at this, these both have retrograde conduction. And that's what causes these gaps to be so large. Whereas when you have an interpolated one or interpolated, that's not the case. This PVC that occurred wasn't able to throw off the normal cadence that the heart was going through. So just be aware when you see these, there's actually a name for whether there's a gap in there, which you can say is compensated or non-compensated, or in the case where it fits there right in between without mixing anything up, that's interpolated or interpolated, however you like to pronounce that. Um, okay, so what the heck is a premature complex with aberrancy? Well, basically the, the idea is this. In aberrancy, the uh, bundled branches haven't fully repolarized yet. So you've got your normal cadence, you've got beat number one, beat number two, beat number three, they're ticking along. When then you have this 
premature beat right here, number four. And what happened was it fired off. It wanted to go early and not both of the bundle branches were ready at the same time. And what happened was that impulse was conducted instead of simultaneously down both the left and the right. Instead, it did the right side, then the left side, which is what creates this really wide looking QRS. So that's right at about uh, four small boxes. Um, additionally, that's what gives it these extra spikes. I mean, this one actually is R S R prime shaped, which means that you had the left and the right bundle go off separately, as opposed to the previous beat where you just have an R S wave where for all intents and purposes, and this one is right at three small boxes. Um, this one actually went off perfectly normally, but this one took longer, which is why it's wider, because it went one then the other rather than both simultaneously. And that's the hallmark of aberrancy. It's just premature beats being conducted in an abnormal way uh, through the bundle branches. So if we take a look at this uh, next rhythm here, I think it'll explain it even better. We have beat number two, three, four, five, and six. And what you can see here really helps sell it because beats number one, three, and five look perfectly normal, right? You've got your P wave here, you've got your QRS, it's nice and narrow, it's probably only two small boxes wide. Whereas beats two, four, and six, actually they look kind of like PVCs, don't they? Well, if we actually measure out how wide our QRS is, it's only about three small boxes, which means it's within normal range for a QRS. It's not wide, meaning it's probably not a PVC. Not to mention, you have a P wave in front of it, and PVCs do not have P waves in front of them, at least in this fashion. So, that clues me in to say that this is probably a PAC with aberrant conduction. Um, so the reason we talk about this is some really cool, cool things. And I'm going to read off just a little bit here to kind of spell it out for you guys. What this is called is actually Ashman's phenomenon. And the idea is you've got refractory periods within your AV node, within your bundle branches, and you're waiting for that recharge cycle to go through. And in particular, if you have a faster heart rate or a heart rate where you have a lot of variability, so it goes fast and then it goes slow and then it goes fast and then it goes slow, like with AFib, um, what happens is that long interval followed by a really short one actually speeds up the refractory period um, and makes it so the next beat can happen even faster so that um, your tendency to see aberrant conduction in fast heart rates um, that were previously irregular is a lot more frequent. In fact, the reason why SVT has a tendency to look just like VTAC because it gets wider is all due to that and aberrant conduction. That, in a fair number of cases, SVT with aberrant conduction looks just like VTAC, um, which is why we treat tachycardias based on whether they have a pulse or not, or if they're symptomatic, not so much based on whether it's truly VTAC or SVT. So something important to remember for ACLS. All right, so this is probably one of the most amazing examples of real life aberrancy that I've come across. Um, I'm just gonna number these out and do a few drawing things here real quick while you look at the strip. Now notice this is more than six seconds. It's actually an eight second strip, but I circled the hash marks for you. And I'm gonna label beats number one. So, 
First things first, what's the normal bead in this one? Well, it's the one that looks most regular. So uh, your eyes are kind of drawn to beat four or beat six. Both of those look really nice and normal. You know, your P wave is upright, your QRS looks good, and you got a halfway decent T wave. So we'll say that beat six is normal. So I'm gonna put an N right underneath that. So we'll say beat four is normal, beat two, who else? Eight. 10, 12, and even 14 way out here. So we figured out those are normal. Um, within that, who's abnormal? Well, we've got beat one and three, which are really large and pointing down. So we're gonna name that A. Oh, beat five actually looks different. So we're gonna name that B. This is an A, this is a B. This is an A, this is a B, even this is an A way out here. Well, I think we found our pattern, didn't we? Um, not only do we have an irregular, but there's also a pattern of ectopic beats, where it's every other one, and that there's two types. Well, that's pretty nuts, um, and in fact that these ectopics tend to look pretty early. Well, ultimately we have to come up with a rate, right? Well, if we look through here, this is our true ending point. So we will say that we have 11 beats, so we'll say 11 times 10 equals 110. We are tachycardic. So let's go through, um, and we'll actually even talk about these ectopics a little, well, we'll go through and talk about it on our P waves. So we've got our normal heartbeats. And what do those look like? Well, our P wave is upright, they're rounded, so we're in pretty good shape there. They're pretty well uniform. There's a little bit of artifact in there, but we'll say, And are they regular? Well, that would be a good question. So let's measure these out real quick. And that comes out to about 28. And we'll measure from here to here. Those two normal ones come out to 28. And we'll do one more just to be safe. Also 28. So they are regular. 1P for every QRS. <clears throat> All right, so that's part one. Next, we're going to talk about A. What can you tell me about the A's? Well, they actually do have a bit of a P wave right here. Um, and that's what I'm going to say that is. It's kind of combined with your T wave, so it does make it a little bit difficult, but it is fairly sharp. So let's try and get a PRI off of that. And we'll say that it starts right here. And of course it ends right here. And that is one, two, three, four. So that is about four. And we'll do the same over here. From here to here. One, two, three, four. All right, so we've got four small boxes in between. Um, and the P waves pretty well look identical for each of those. So we'll say upright and uniform. Can't really test regularity because they are premature. Um, but there is one P for QRS because all of those T waves look identical for that particular B. What about B? Well, B has basically the same scenario where it's got these uh, peaked T waves that are right here. A little long, um, and they are one, two, three, four across. And I'll measure this one way out here just so we can declutter a little bit. Two, three, four. So the PRIs match for there as well. Since I'm doing all this, I may as well get the PRI on a regular beat if I can. That'll be one, two, three and a half or so. 
Yeah, probably closer to a three, honestly. Let's measure one more just to be safe if I can find a decent one. One, two, three. All right, well, that's good to know. Either way, uh, if you go back to the bees and you look at all of their P waves, those are also the same. They're upright uniform, one P per QRS. Now, if we do our PRIs, which I've kind of done already, with this one being three, four, and four, 0 0.04 equals 0.12, 6, 0.16 and those are all normal so finally we're left with our QRS breakdown right so I've got my normal beat and how does my QRS look on him well I got this one way out here we'll look at that so all of these normal beats have uniform QRS's and they're actually in the shape of R waves and my PRI sorry my QRS width on those right at about 2 so we'll say 2 times 0 0.04 is 3.08 um, next we'll look at A and what does our A's have to offer? Well, those are pretty different looking, aren't they? I'm actually going to measure up on these. They're at about there and actually there. Maybe three. Either way, if we look at all of these A's, they have pretty much the exact same shape where it is a very uniform. And they have the tiniest of R waves, a large S wave, and then a second little S wave as well. And so for that, we'll say 3 times 0 0.04 equals 0 0.12, which is also still normal. And then finally, we'll do B. What does B have to offer? And that's these little tiny ones right here. So let's see here, we've got just barely one, two, about two small boxes apart, maybe a little wider. Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and say it's two. Uh, they're not quite uniform. You'll see that beat 13 doesn't quite match beat nine. Um, and even beat number five, they're off a little bit, um, but their essence is essentially the same. And so we will say they're um, similar with an, let's see, we'll definitely say that nine and 13 are identical and say that they have a Q S pattern and that they're about two boxes across so we'll take 2 times 0 0.04 equals 0 0.08, all of which are essentially normal. So what you're looking at <coughs> is actually sinus rhythm with by Gemini. PACs and aberrant conduction. And there you have it. Just that easy to put together. Um, basically what's happening is um, the early beat uh, leaves the sinus node partially refractory causing the next beat to have a longer PRI. And that's why you see the, um, the B um, sorry, the A and the B having that longer PRI because they're coming on the heels of a normal beat having just finished, which is why they get a little bit longer by comparison. All right, final item in this section. Um, I've heard a number of people in the past talk about non-conducted PACs, but I always wonder, you know, does it 
does everyone realize what that means? And so this really breaks it down. I'll go over the slide ever so quickly. By the way, APBs is another way to say PACs. Anyway, um, what happens is, if you just look at this, if any impulse occurs when one of the bundle branches is refractory, but the other one's recovered, the impulse goes through, but you wind up with aberrant conduction. So aberrant implies that it goes through. It just looks weird when it does it. Now, in the case of non-conducted PAC, um, the uh, AV node, the bundle branches, all of it are refractory. And therefore, nothing goes through. The P wave occurs, but the rest of it doesn't happen. Um, and so how can you tell just by looking at this? Well, um, T waves are supposed to be rounded. They're never supposed to be sharp. So a normal T wave in this scenario, you've got your P, Q, R, S. And so the T wave should actually look something like this. And so what happened was that sharp P got mixed in with it. And so that's why you wind up with this weird looking T wave instead. So sharp T waves is basically implies that there's a P wave mixed in there some way, somehow. Um, so remember, you know, the voltage, the up and the down, it's a measurement of all the electricity in the heart at that moment, which is why it's an additive effect that if you have a T wave plus a P wave, they combine into something bigger or even smaller if they're heading opposite directions. Um, and that's what this represents and why you can tell that those are P waves stacked onto T waves. Aberrant conduction occurs when? The ECG leads are placed incorrectly, so the waveform is displayed wrong? No, that's totally inaccurate. That's not the case. An impulse arrives, exits the AV junction at a time when the bundle branches are not equally ready to conduct? That is correct. That one is exactly the definition of aberrant conduction because the impulse still gets conducted down the bundle branches, except it hits them at slightly different timing, hence it creates the unique pattern because of that. These other two, just to go over them, after a variable pause that is longer than the underlying lying sinus length, that has more to do with figuring out whether uh, premature beats are happening, you know, interpolated or not. Whereas this next one, the P to P interval between the QRS complex prior to and after the premature beat is the same as the underlying P to P interval also has nothing to do with aberrant conduction at all. So you can throw that one out the window as well. Please identify the type of ectopic beat displayed. Well, just looking at it, you can tell you've got a big old gap here and then the heart rhythm picks back up. But you'll notice that this has P waves in front of it and this one does not. So this is not a case where the rhythm just stopped and then picked back up where it left off. In fact, we're looking at a late beat that then is of a different type altogether because it doesn't even have a P wave. This is actually likely to be a junctional beat. So at that point, I would say it's not a premature beat, doesn't have any aberrancy, doesn't have a U wave. This is an escape beat for sure, a junctional escape beat to be specific. Please identify the type of ectopic beat displayed. So I apologize for the uh, clarity on this one, but we'll just go ahead and look at it and we can tell that beat number two is what we're looking at. And is this an escape beat? Well, no, it's on the early side, so it's not an escape beat. We're not looking at U waves. In fact, we're looking to see if this premature beat has aberrant conduction or not. And so if you look at this QRS here compared to this one, they're both narrow, but this one has a completely different conformation. And so at that point, you're looking at aberrant conduction rather than just a premature beat. So premature beat with aberrant conduction being the answer. 
please list the inherent rates of the following pacemaker sites within the cardiac conduction system. And there's a very specific slide that lists all these out if you want to go back and refer to it. But we'll just start. Which of these sinus node ones are correct? Well, the sinus node of 40 to 60, that's absolutely not correct. So we'll take B off the list. Sinus node between 80 and 110, that's also incorrect. So we'll take that off the list. So now that brings us down to A and D. Which of these is most accurate? Well, the AV junction, does it go 40 to 60 or 20 to 60? Well, of course, it's not D. So we can take that one off, which really just leaves us with A. And that is correct. Your sinus node runs from 60 to 100. Your AV junction is 40 to 60. And your ventricles are 20 to 40. If you look at these other ones, you'll see that that one's incorrect and that one's incorrect as well. Irritability of cardiac cells and potentially life-threatening arrhythmias may be caused by which of the following? As we go through the list, and I've talked about it multiple times, that ischemia, anoxia, that irritates any set of cells, so particularly of concern. Uh, medications will definitely cause this. Uh, methamphetamine's a really good one. Adrenaline, we, the natural system that the heart uses to speed itself up, that the body uses. Adrenaline increases irritability. Mechanical trauma, uh, bruising of the heart, a steering wheel, things of that nature could even cause um, those cells to become irritable. Cardiomyopathy is definitely one. You stretch out that heart and you cause it to be um, misshapen. That creates some irritability. And uh, your electrolytes within normal limits if everything's normal, then it's not a problem. So electrolytes is the only thing on that list that is not potentially gonna cause irritability of cardiac cells.